to the Gentiles. Look at First Corinthians, I mean, Acts, uh, Ephesians five. Uh, <laughs> First Thessalonians. I've got my mind's a little foggy today. Sometimes I leave the house and don't take it with me. I need to go back and say, <laughs> "Now mind, <laughs> catch up." Yeah, <laughs> First Thessalonians four. <laughs> I'll be saying one thing, my mind off over here somewhere else, and I need to get them together. All right, First Thessalonians 4 <clears throat> and verse number 13. It is First Thessalonians, not Ephesians, that many believe was the first book the Apostle Paul wrote. All right? First Thessalonians 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. He uses a euphemism. What is that? That simply takes the sting away from it. I would not have to be concerned them which are dead. Well, Christians aren't dead. If they are ever referred to as dead, they're dead in Christ. See, the dead in Christ, in Christ, they don't die, they live. All right. So he says here, I would not have to be ignorant concerning them which are asleep. You sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, I believe that. Do you believe that? Yes. Even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God raise from the graveyard. See, I put my private interpretation in there. Because there's a lot of folks that believe they sleep out here in the graveyard. What did he say? What does it say right here? He'll what now? He'll bring them with him. I said that to a dear old lady over 30 years ago. I said that one scripture right there. I quoted it to her. She'd been in church all her life. She was in her 80s. She had never seen that. And it's obvious that she had always been associated with amillennial or postmillennial teaching. To bring them with him means that they are somewhere with him. The apostle said to be absent from the bodies to be where? In the graveyard? No, present with the Lord. He said, I have a desire to part and be with Christ, which is far greater. That's where you are. You're with him. That is if you're born again. So the dead in Christ, he'll bring with him. But you have to understand, well, then what's coming up from the grave? 1 Corinthians 15, what's coming up out of the ground? The person's not coming from the ground. The body comes up from the ground. It is sown a terrestrial body, terra in Latin means of the earth, terra, terrestrial, all right, it will be raised a celestial body, celestial means of the stars, of the heavens, of heaven, it will be raised that kind of body, it is sown corruptible, it is raised incorruptible, it is sown dishonorably or in a dishonor but it is raised in honor, the apostle said he will change my vile body to be likened to his glorious body. The New Testament never says anything good about the body. I'm sorry. <laughs> Nothing good about it. He said, in my flesh, which is his body. Go read Romans, the first seven chapters of Romans. I've read, I've read Romans now in the last two or three weeks, uh, at least uh, three or four times, the first few chapters especially, to try to get a real sense on what Paul's saying. And he's making it very clear. The body is corrupted. And the brain that you're thinking with right now it's part of the body. It's part of the flesh. It's a fleshly brain. It can be used to think on spiritual things, to have your mind renewed, Romans 12, but it's still a flesh thing. Your brain is. So he said, in my flesh, is your brain part of your flesh? Yes, it is. Dwelleth no good thing. So what do I do? I have a conundrum here. I have a dilemma. What am I going to do about my flesh? You have to have the mind of Christ. And that can only come by spiritual renewal. First of all, by the new birth. And then by spiritual renewal. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Shedding light on the Word of God. And fill that brain full of Scripture and spiritual truth. Then you begin to think like God thinks and see things the way He does. So the body's vile, it's corrupt, it's corruptible, must put on incorruption. Think of it this way. You are a spirit being. If you're born again, you've been born of the spirit of God. Otherwise, you simply have the spirit of life in you, which the unsaved man has, because all life comes from God. 
and you are living in a body, communicating through a soul, intellect, emotion, and will. That's what you're doing. So when you, spirit being, the spirits of just men made perfect, it says in Hebrews, when you, spirit being, come with the Lord Jesus Christ back from glory, he will raise up a glorified body, likened to his glorious body. And his glorious body is something to behold. I'll tell you that right now. On this earth, his body appeared to be the body of a man. He took part of the same, the Bible says, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. Christ had to die. But how is God going to die? It's impossible for God to die, but he became a man. That's the advent. That's the incarnation. And they couldn't kill him. They couldn't take his life. He had to lay it down. But he picked it back up again on the third day. That's the body we will have. He could appear with the disciples. They showed up one morning and there he was with fish on the fire after his resurrection. Sat down and ate with them. That's the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our body will be likened to his glorious body. When does that take place? That takes place when he comes to take you to be with him. John 14, he prophesied of the rapture, but he didn't call it that. What does it say in John 14, verse 1? You believe in God? Believe also in me. For my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. That doesn't sound like he's coming back to put a kingdom on this earth. It sounds to me like he's coming back to get them. Right? That's a preview of the rapture. But nobody understood it to mean that. They just simply thought, well, the Lord's going to come back. All right? So who then had this mystery revealed to him about the rapture? Mm -hmm. So Saul of Tarsus, I'll show you a mystery. Now, why did God wait to give him that mystery? That's a good question, don't you think? Yes, sir. John 11 is loaded. Sure, it's loaded. <laughs> He sure did. It's about not only the death of Jesus to save Israel, but that all of the righteous of the earth might be gathered together into one. That's the one body. Yes, it is. And he didn't even know what he's talking about. No, but he used an unsaved man yeah. to say it. Yeah. He certainly did. That shows the sovereignty of God. Yeah, it did. Yeah. When they prophesied the Old Testament, these things, the Bible said plainly that they desired to look into them. Peter did. Peter said that and could not because it wasn't time for them to understand it. The rapture's in the Old Testament. The first type of it's Enoch. You know, 60, uh, uh, what does it live? 365 years? I believe that's what it was. And uh, he, had, he had an appearance with, of... Uh, of, uh, of the Lord and, and for 300 years he walked with God and then God came in and all of a sudden took him. He, began, he prophesied. Enoch prophesied in the book of Jude. It says, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Jude prophesied that. And he prophesied it for hundreds of years and then he was taken. All of a sudden he was not for God took him. Not even a body to bury. <laughs> he was gone. Okay. Yes, he was. He was the seventh, wasn't he? He was the seventh from Adam. His name means initiation or teaching, Enoch. 777 years. Uh, from Adam, from the creation, 777 years. So chronologists have got that marked down and numbered right down to the day, huh? Well, I wouldn't try to dispute it. That's, that's 777. That's the completion. <laughs> uh, Enoch. He had a son, didn't he? Who was his son? What did he name his son? You know what that means? Something? 
When he is gone, it will come. When he is dead, it will be sent. It has to do with something's going to happen when Methuselah leaves here. All right. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. He also used her as an object lesson. Here's a Gentile coming out of ignorance and darkness, yet she believes more than you standing around me. Yeah. Here you are. The He said, you simply say the word, my servant will be healed. <laughs> uh, he, uh, you can go a little further with that. We run out of time here, but you can go a little further with that because what he's doing is saying here, he said, I have other sheep that have not this flock, you know. And he said, if, uh, if the Sodom and Gomorrah had, had the preaching you've had, they'd long since repented. You know, uh, the idea is that you're children of light. You've got the book, the canons and all that and the prophets, but look what you've done with it. Now, what are they going to do with it? And that's, uh, that's, that's another issue. We've run out of time. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll let you go. Brother Roger Lee, will you dismiss?